happy Friday, everybody. I hope you're having a good day today so far, and hope you had a good week. Okay, so I did a video, a live video on Facebook on Thursday, explaining why I didn't do a podcast for Monday. I just, I didn't have the time. Um, I, I had my daughter with me, and then we had church, and there just wasn't any time to do it. I've been really busy. I have um, one person out at work, and so we've just been working a lot more, doing a lot more stuff, trying to cover for her being gone, so it's been really hectic, and she won't be back until April 3rd, so it, we have, what, is that another week or so before that? Anyway, so here I am recording this. <clears throat> it is 1 a.m., on Friday morning because I said I was going to put this up on Friday morning around 9 or 10 a.m. So uh, here I am. I had to wait for the computer. I had to wait for everybody to go to bed for it to be quiet. And I'm going to be so exhausted at work when I get there at, you know, 7 a.m. But it's okay because I get off early. So it's no big deal. I'll be fine. Anyway, I just want to jump right into the episode. Um, I want to read the daily promise and it says for that will save the afflicted people but will bring down high looks Psalm 1827 humble are the people of God and they will be saved humble are they that trust upon Christ for they have given up hope in their own worth power and strength to, to sustain themselves all will be saved who reject themselves and trust upon the life death resurrection ascension and deity of Christ Jesus they shall taste the life everlasting Okay, so I have been been seeing a lot of stuff going around in the media lately, and it involves our children. And um, as much as I'm concerned about a lot of the stuff that has been taking place over the last it, it, at least five years, but here recently it's really ramped up in the last year or two, um, what is happening with our children is what bothers me the most. And I know that some parents are speaking up against it, but I don't understand why there aren't more. I don't know if it's afraid of them, if they're afraid to say something because they don't want to be labeled um, homophobes, transphobes, bigots, whatever. And I don't think that anybody should be worried about being called those names because they don't mean anything. They've been so watered down that really the only thing that those mean is I don't like your opinion because it's different than mine. That's really all those mean anymore. So I don't think we should be afraid of being labeled those. We know we're not. Um, I I've never understood the terminology of... Um, if someone says that they're against, you know, same-sex couple lifestyles, the gay lifestyle, they're against it because it's, you know, immoral or for religious purposes. I don't understand the terminology homophobia because phobia, it, the definition is it's an irrational fear of something. So people who are against gay lifestyles, we don't have an irrational fear of gay people we just disagree with the lifestyle. We think it's immoral. It's against God's natural design of things. So I never really understood it. And that's why it bothers me that more parents aren't speaking up. Because I think if more did, this would not be happening. So I have a few articles that I pulled up because I wanted to talk about some of the stuff that's going on. Um, The first thing I want to talk about, I saw this the other day on... I think it was on Slightly Offensive, and this is from dcweekly.org, and it's Oregon's top children's hospital teaches young boys to tuck their genitals and directs boys to a sex shop, and this is by Jeff Rizone. Um, It says, and I'm not sure how you pronounce the name of this hospital, but Doran Betcher Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon is under fire after disturbing material instructing children to tuck their genitals and put, quote, your testicles inside your body, end quote. Tucking is not just for males, the Doran Bircher Children's Hospital assures in its instructional guide. 
that tucking is moving. Oh God, I hate reading this. And also, by the way, I don't know if this will be able to go up on YouTube. Um, they may not like what I'm talking about. I just feel so uncomfortable reading it. Um, okay. Tucking is moving the penis testicles or both out of the way. This makes the genital area look smoother and flatter, the document notes. Tucking can reduce any concerns you have about your body, how your clothes fit, and how safe you feel in public. People of all genders can tuck. I didn't know that. All women, too. Uh, and all genders, you mean both genders. They say it like there's so many. The guide includes a disclaimer warning readers that it uses terminology that may be offensive. This information uses words, um, penis, scrotum, and testicles. We know you may not use those terms or identify with them. We use them here to refer to body parts that people with tucky needs have while understanding those words are not for everyone. The Children's Hospital notes. It's such weird wording, the way they, they're they talking about how it's not it may not be for everyone. It's just, I, I feel like the wording gives like this broad spectrum of different genders. It's just so weird to read it like that. The, um, the document presents three methods for children interested in tucking, taping their genitals or wearing tights, spandex laden underwear or underwear, or putting your testicles inside your body. Um, and I don't know why you would recommend any of this for n anyone, let alone children. Um, I'm not so sure that it's actually medically safe to be taping those. I, I just, I don't feel like that could be good for you. Um, tucking with tape is more secure, the instructional guide states. Your tuck is less likely to come undone, but you have a higher risk of skin irritation. It is also harder to use the bathroom because you need to take off the tape and then reapply it. We recommend trying the methods without tape first as they are the most gentle and convenient. Um, I, I know Elijah said something about also about um, heat not being like a lot of body heat from the tape and not being good for boys because it can unless he was just being stupid because sometimes I don't know when he's being serious and when he's actually being real about what he's saying just because of his sense of humor um but he acted as if that would be really bad for you um children interested in concealing their testicles quote unquote inside your body must press gently and use two or three fingers and try to guide them into the in what in juvenile canals in juvenile I don't know what that word is I don't even know what that is the document which includes a graphic diagram encourages to continue tucking even if it makes them get nauseous or aroused this can feel strange at first possibly even uncomfortable yeah duh you should not feel faint or nauseated or have extreme pain. If you do, take a break and try again later. Once you're tucked, you pull it back between your legs. If you find yourself getting aroused, take a break and try again later. Um, yeah, because if you are, it would make it impossible to tuck. So the Gender Clinic Safe Tucking Handout by Alicia Powell is on Scribd. You can get the document if you want it. Um, the Children's Hospital even encourages kids to visit sex shops to purchase clothes that, quote, sell gender-affirming clothing items as well as sex toys, videos, and more. We're talking about children here. Even I wouldn't be comfortable going into a sex shop. And we're telling children, don't you have to be 18 to go to sex shops? Pretty sure that's, that's like, the, the idea. It's kind of like alcohol, cigarettes. You have to be an actual adult. To be able to do it. So the fact that they're telling kids to go. What sex shop is open up to children? Because I would like to know. So we can get it shut down. While the Oregon. The Oregon sex shop she Bob. Is for people age 18 and older. The guide states. They offer appointments. Before or after hours. For younger shoppers. Is that legal? 
We're going to look into that because I'm pretty sure that's not legal just because it's after hours. Um, so this is the first, this first appeared, um, on the Gateway Pundit. I'm going to pull up the link for this real quick from Scribd. Um, okay, so it's not there. You're going to have to get, I, I'm not going to get a subscription for that. I've had it with Scribd before. You can get, like, all kinds of really, like, documents and papers and things that you can't just access freely on the internet um that's why I, I got the autopsy for george floyd and was able to look through the entire autopsy um but you have to pay so i'm not gonna do that so you've got that and that that's just that makes me uncomfortable to read and you know i'll be 36 next month and i feel very uncomfortable reading that i can't imagine giving this to kids i just I can't imagine it, but it's not even that. So, um, I wanted to point out that this is something that has been going on a lot longer than probably people have realized because they're not paying attention. Um, 2017 seems like forever ago when you think about everything that's happened thus far and it does feel like forever ago. And Matt Walsh has been talking about, the left wanting to sexualize your children and even a lot longer than that he's been doing this for years and most people just haven't really been paying attention and I found an article that he wrote back in 2017 and he was talking about a Teen Vogue um, magazine an article about it was talking about anal sex and um it says how to do it the right way. I confess that I didn't read the entire piece, but I can report that it is quite lengthy and it goes into extremely specific detail. Whether you want to try sodomy with a girl or a boy, the article written by a sad pervert named Gigi Engel outlines the procedure and gives some helpful tips to get you going. The writer preface, uh, prefaces this how-to session with something of a moral defense of sodomy. As it's always the case when anyone on the left attempts to morally defend something, she comes off like a cliched middle schooler trying to convince her friends to smoke cigarettes. Come on, everyone is doing it, she says creepily. She points out that some people in the Greek and Roman empires did, which obviously means we should too. I guess we should resurrect the gladiator games while we're at it, and God forbid the scholar of history ever finds out what people in the Aztec empire used to do. One can only imagine what the Teen Vogue article would look like. A guide to ripping the heart out of a human sacrifice and consuming his flesh. How to do it the right way. Now let's leave aside the fact that there is no right or healthy way to engage in this kind of behavior as the AIDS epidemic and basic human biology clearly attest. In fact, let's leave aside entirely the finer points of sodomy. That's not a conversation I feel particularly inclined to have at the moment or at any other moment. Suffice it to say that we live in a culture where a mainstream publication does not hesitate to coach kids on how to have anal sex. It used to be that a predator had to groom children in secret, but now he or she can do it in the pages of a widely read magazine or on TV or in the movies or through song or in school, especially in school. A quick story in a similar vein. A frustrated parent wrote to me recently to complain that her daughter's ninth grade health teacher had recommended that her students masturbate to avoid teen pregnancy. Apparently, the same health teacher has at various other points launched into soliloquies about abortion, sodomy, a common theme as we've seen, and oral sex. Some of these sermons were part of the curriculum, some were not. The mother complained to the administration, but it accomplished nothing. She went to the school board, but they didn't care. She spoke with the superintendent, but she was stonewalled. They all treated her like she was the crazy one. The dirty old lady encouraging children to fondle themselves was the innocent victim of an overbearing helicopter parent. This was nothing surprising about that story. This kind of thing goes on in hundreds of schools across the country. They, they're they even teaching kids about transvestites in kindergarten now. And there's nothing particularly surprising about Teen Vogue. Pretty much all magazines, just like most shows, movies, etc. these days, are packed full of ugliness, debauchery, and stupidity. The stuff targeted at kids will tend to be the worst of all because the left wants nothing more than to turn your child into a sexual deviant. This is the primary goal of modern leftism. 
Nothing matters more to them than converting your child into the religion of self-indulgence. After all, it may be too late to mold you into a desperate, lonely, sex-obsessed freak, but your daughter, well, she's ripe for the picking. These predators generally have two justifications they trot out whenever anyone has the audacity to get mad at them for promoting deviancy and fetishism to kids. I heard both yesterday when I complained on Twitter about the sodomy edition of Teen Vogue. One, kids are going to be doing whatever debauched activity, anal sex in this case, anyway, so they may as well learn how to do it safely. And number two, it's none of your business. Go away and let us foist our disgusting, idiotic sexual views on your children. To the first point, I say only that it has never until very recently been taken for granted that kids will spend their free time performing hardcore sex acts. If we're appealing to history here, the Romans did it, then I think it's valid for me to, to observe that no civilized society in history has considered it a given that children will sodomize each other. This ought to tell us that it's not a given, or it shouldn't be. We have made it a given by treating it as one. Kids do it anyway because many of the adults in their lives are incompetent, unfit, morally bankrupt clowns who expect them to do it anyway. If that is your ex expectation, it will surely be met. But it need not be like this. It isn't natural. Kids have been trained to prostitute themselves to one another. They are only responding to their conditioning. Every prostitute has a pimp who made her that way. In this case, the pimps reside in the media, the government, the schools, and oftentimes, the home. To the second point, I say that it is precisely my business what these powerful cultural forces are telling my kids. The moment you open your mouth in public to promote whatever form of moral and physical self-destruction happens to get you off, you have made it my business. My kids have to exist in a culture where this garbage spews forth from practically every glowing screen and gabbing mouth they come across. So yes, it very much concerns me. If you use a magazine article or a TV show or a movie or a song or a classroom to indoctrinate America's youth into your cult of, war of whorishness, I'm going to take it personally. My kids are a part of that unfortunate group known as the youth, which means you are directly trying to harm them. You can't, you aren't just victimizing kids generally, but my kids. Yeah, and that's how I feel. My kids have to grow up in this. They have to live in this society that is being created. And if you don't care enough about your kids to stand up and say something, then I will do it for you. I will do it for you. But I, I just feel like your kids are the most important thing. And it is your job to protect them from everything. And to just not say anything when the schools and the media and everything that is out there is trying to indoctrinate your child into being sexually deviant because they prefer it that way because you're easier to control, then nothing else should matter other than making sure that you teach your kid that this thing, these things are wrong and you don't do what they say and try to raise them in a way that they understand that this is out there but not to fall prey to it. It's really sad that parents, that a lot of parents won't do that. Um, when you use your platform to announce, hey girls, anal sex is great, or hey students, try masturbating. I'm going to treat you and your message the same as I would if you were some toothless pedophile in a trench coat whispering it to them on the playground. I see little distinction between the two of you, except that you are trying to sexualize my children for ideological reasons and he for more personal ones. But you're both despicable in any case, and your behavior is evil. You are nothing but a pimp trying to recruit another generation of kids into your ranks, and that is how they'll treat you. I think all parents need to approach the situation like this. We ought to be defensive and protective of our children. You ought to see this stuff as a direct attack on your family because that's what it is. These people want to make a pervert of your son and a sex doll of your daughter. You ought to take that personally. You ought to take it personally that Teen Vogue just tried to convince your daughter to let a boy sodomize her. That's about as personal as it gets. The left only succeeds in its relentless efforts to corrupt our children because many parents, tasked by God with protecting their kids' souls, are not willing to do the job. They hear about the schools handing out condoms to 8th graders, or they see degrading filth on TV, or they see half-naked homosexuals marching down the street in pride parades, 
trying to entice their kids into a life of sexual deviancy and spiritual desolation. And they're afraid it would be impolite to raise a fuss over it. They certainly want, wouldn't want to come off like some sort of Puritans. God forbid. So while they're busy being polite and open-minded, their kids are feasted upon by these vampires and destroyed. But hey, that's all right. Better they let Satan's legions kidnap the souls of their sons and daughters than get a bit angry and say something untoward. For my part, I trust that the Lord will forgive me for being even a little overzealous in my efforts to guard my children's hearts. If it's possible to be too angry about degenerate praying upon degenerates preying upon my kids, or to be too forceful in fighting against their efforts to turn my daughter and my sons into something as abominable as them, I must entrust myself to the mercy of our loving God and hope for the best. I certainly like my chances a lot more than I would if I were not zealous or angry or forceful at all, even as my kids are exploited, brainwashed, and dragged into hell. Of course, parents in both categories will stand before the throne one day. I just don't want it to be in the second camp when that time comes. Okay, so, um, I, I've been told that when I talk about certain things that I sound hateful, um, and I get angry. And, you know, I think there's a pretty big distinction between being hateful and having a righteous anger over what you see. Because I am angry. It does make me mad. I do get fired up over certain things that I see happening. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with me being angry at what I see taking place. Especially when it involves children. And what I mentioned when I was on Facebook Live, I mentioned that, you know, this generation of children coming up, I think when they are in their early to mid-20s, I think we're going to see a huge increase in suicides because this is where we're telling kids, boys, that they can be girls and trying to transition them and giving them sex cross-sex cross, cross sex hormones and chemically castrating them or even physically and one of these days, they're, they're going to realize, hey, that, that was wrong. That's not right. I need to fix this. But by then, it's going to be too late. All that stuff, is it's not reversible. I know that they lie and they say, oh, yeah, it's absolutely reversible. It doesn't matter. They change their mind and want to go back to being a boy later in life. They can do it with no problem. That is not true. There are videos all over TikTok that are clearly suppressed and not put through for people to see of people that were, when they were minors, were uh, transitioned from being a boy to a girl or vice versa. And then later on in life, it's like they realize that they were lied to and that they were brainwashed and they want to fix it and they want to reverse it. But a lot of them can't do that. They can't go back to looking like a girl and being feminine. They can't have children you can't get that stuff back. And it's really sad. And I think you're going to see a huge jump in suicides of that age group from the generation coming up now. I really do think you're going to see that. But obviously we won't know until that time comes, right? We'd have to just wait and see. Okay. Let's see what else that we've got going on. So, this is back from March 9th from Rebecca Downs at townhall.com about activists hosting a sex ed summer camp for children as young as seven years old. So, <clears throat> this is it's talking about there was um, some, I'm going to kind of just paraphrase all of this. Some Twitter threads that were circulating, highlighting the efforts of so called sex educators, will go through to groom children. We're not merely talking about teenagers here, but preteens and younger. Ashley Robertson is looking to charge parents $250 to teach their children in 3rd to 5th grade about sex with an emphasis on affirming non-binary, body-positive, social-emotional learning through play. Though the event page for um, Eventbrite has since been removed, Archived versions and screenshots remain, and as of Wednesday evening, it is still available on All Events Indiana's webpage. <clears throat> so it's supposed to run from June 6th to 10th. Um, so it's about 36 hours of activity and discussions. And I guess it's still happening. I'm not sure. 
It's two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, they have orientation on May twenty eighth. It says all families participating must attend an orientation May twenty eighth at ten a.m. Where we'll sign behavior agreements, enrollment paperwork, and waivers. If you do not attend, you will not be refunded, and your child will not be able to attend camp. Um. So if you go through the fact the um. The uh, I just totally went blank. I don't know. Frequently asked questions page. Um, one question responding no when answering will my child be told values based rules. The answer goes on to read with original emphasis that, quote, this curriculum is based on the foundational principle that each individual comes to the content with an individual set of values. It is our job to ask questions and help students consider multiple perspectives. We are not to tell students anything unless it is scientific information. However, the program flies in the face of biology and thus scientific information, when it comes to sex and gender, not only does the program advertise itself as non-binary, but it affirms this in the very first part of the frequently asked questions section. So the question says, will the kids be divided by gender when learning about puberty, bodies, and sex? No. Gender is a spectrum and not a binary. Everyone needs to learn about all bodies so that it can be supportive friends, partners, and parents if that happens in their futures. Another answer confirms that children will see condom demonstrations. At this age, kids are primed for level-headed learning. They are information gatherers. There's no shame or ickiness associated with using band-aids. And that same philosophy is applied to condoms and other barriers in this body-positive curriculum. Comparing using a band-aid on a child to condoms on a child... That is the wildest analogy I think I've ever seen. Um, there is no shame or ickiness in using a condom. The shame and ickiness is that a grown adult wants to teach that to small children that shouldn't even be thinking about having sex yet. That's where the shame comes in. It's really weird. It's so weird that these people are so obsessed with sexualizing children. And I don't know if it's purely for ideological purposes, uh, being able to control the masses, or if it's because they're all child predators in one way or another. I would assume it's the latter. I would think you would have to be some kind of child predator to feel like this is okay behavior and be comfortable doing that. I, I don't know. Ashley Robertson, sexuality educator and founder of the organization Let's Talk About Sex Ed with Miss Ashley, opened a June event called Sex Ed Summer Camp for grades 3 to 5 to the Indianapolis community. From the event website, Ashley offers what she claims is a positive, affirming take on puberty, human sexuality, and social emotional skills without coercive, coercive abstinence-based strategies. Ashley plans to show students from age 7 to 12 condom demonstrations, the gender spectrum, and introspective discussions on sexuality. Um, she said kids need to learn that schools doesn't teach, which is our whole lives curriculum. I'll link this in the description, so if you want to read that, you can. Um, so it says, Ashley has hosted two of the virtual workshops with children recently, sensuality, sex, and orgasms, and potty training and early sex education. So she also has a Facebook group page, Instagram pages, um, and there's content of Ashley holding up a carrot and making suggestive remarks about pervertible objects, um, an animation of condoms sliding onto a banana for National Condom Day. Young children's books where the children are identified as transgender and non-binary. She was on a podcast and interview. She called for parents to safely and healthily introduce pornography to their children. And while Ashley refused to provide any comment regarding the curriculum or activities at the sex education summer camp, she did release a statement regarding an Indiana parent group calling them a hate group here in Indiana 
They target books, social emotional learning, LGBTQ plus folks, etc. The restaurant hosting the summer camp has also refused comment. Um, she also has a habit of advocating for sexually explicit content for those under 18. She was a special guest on a Facebook Live discussion from a group called Let's Talk Polyamory. And they outline how to talk relationship, diversity, sex, kink, and awkward stuff with kids and youth. And she says that sex education students can be as young as potty training age. We're talking that's like what, 18 months to 2 years, depending on how easy it is to potty train your child. So then she also made an appearance on Multiamory, um, a member of Pleasure Podcast, for an episode on kids' consent and sex education. She um, said that she identifies as a feminine, bi-curious, ethically polyamorous, sexually submissive. And she instructed listeners how to talk to your kids about non-monogamy. See, that that's what they're trying to do also is destroy the nuclear family. Don't have, don't be monogamous. Don't get married and have a husband or wife and build a family and love each other and, and stay together. No, just go out and be with whoever you want. And it's, ugh. I mean, I knew the world was going to go to hell in a handbasket. I've read Revelations. I knew it was coming. But to actually experience it, that's what's depressing and heartbreaking. To to be here experiencing it. Um, so she says, with over a... Or the description of the podcast says, with over a decade of experience in the BDSM scene, she isn't shy of perverse topics. Robertson told three holds three teaching degrees and focuses on increasing sex positivity within the family culture. The detailed Spotify profile on Robertson explains. I wonder what her degrees are in. Probably gender studies or something. Um, she opened an in-home daycare. If you take your children to her daycare, you should probably have your kids taken away. So she discussed greater access to pornography for viewers under the age of 18, citing a workshop in the high school curriculum stating that pornographic images and videos are for adult viewership only. It's a little lean for my opinion. Um, according to the multi Amory episode transcript, I say that that's lean because I think that is the law, but the reality is that youth have access to a lot of things. Yeah, they do. But parents should be monitoring that. And it should be very regulated. And it's not. She said, um, they acknowledge that they definitely and absolutely watch pornography before they reached legal age. Yeah, because, I mean, they just kind of shove it in your face. I would prefer that content to talk more about sources of ethical porn and to talk more about collaborative problem solving with your youth or your kid. She advised that instead of clamping down on inappropriate online activity, parents should acknowledge, quote, there's a need that's not met, that children are trying to fulfill by clicking on forbidden sites they're not allowed to be on. Gosh, I pray to God she's not a mother. I really, really do, and that she never will be. Um, She urged for more relaxed and collaborative parenting style in which parents tell their children, it's my job as your parent to acknowledge those needs and meet your needs. So how can we do this and figure this out together? In those situations, even for elementary school kids, there are resources for age-appropriate images that kids can see. Oh my God. Um, she said as an example in the Our Whole Lives elementary curriculum, each child is supposed to have a doodle journal for drawing. Penises and boobs, vulvas, and butts. Wonderful. This woman is disgusting. She also said that if a child is curious about kink, be excited because they're curious about themselves. That's the first thing to celebrate with them. 
it's best to find out what the child already knows first about the explicit subject. The Our Whole Lives webpage from the Unitarian Universalist Association encourages sex ed lessons for children as young as kindergarten or five years old. The page claims that the program offers bullet points such as acceptance of diversity and a social justice approach to inclusive sexuality education. I, God, this is a lot. I can't get comfortable in my chair. So it says the event page provides some information about the kinds of people who will be teaching sex ed to such young children, including their pronouns, uh, of course. One such staff member, Gina Phillips, notes that she is a, quote, board member of Indie Pride and a volunteer with Damien Center. I support the LGBTQ youth in Indianapolis through IYG. It also solicits high school assistants who they are still hiring. So, excuse me, I have to yawn. Representative Jim Banks of Indiana provided a statement for Town Hall noting, I was shocked to read about this in my home state. It's truly disturbing and it shouldn't fall only to conservatives to oppose it. He added that no one should ever tolerate the sexualization of kids emphasizing this shouldn't be a partisan issue and that more on the left need to start speaking out against this evil. I absolutely agree. I want to talk about this um, gay pride parade that took place in a school in Austin. And I saw this on Louder with Crowder. Joseph Gunderson wrote it that um, the attorney general says that they broke the law. And so I was curious what they were going to say because... I was upset when I, I saw that this happened, but when I heard it was in Austin, I thought, well, you know, Austin is a, a mini carbon copy of California, so you can't be too surprised. But to know that it's happening in Texas, it's I don't like it. But it says that sexual instruction to young children has become a hot-button issue since Florida passed the Parental Rights and Education Bill. Why it's an issue is beyond me. Leftists just really want to push their sexualized indoctrination on young children. Well, for Pride Week, one school in Austin, Texas, decided they would go through with a completely insane series of activities to celebrate. They held a gay pride parade and even joined in secret groups for secret conversations, telling children that whatever was said must remain confidential. Just so we're clear, that means they didn't want the students speaking to their parents about it. Thankfully, the Texas AG isn't having any of this bullcrap. The Post-Millennial reports that Attorney General Kim Paxton sent a letter to the school district on Tuesday in which he stated that states, both states, quote, by hosting Pride Week, your district has, at best, undertaken a week-long instructional effort in human sexuality without parental consent. Or worse, your district is cynically pushing a week-long indoctrination of your students that not only fails to obtain parental consent, but subtly cuts parents out of the loop. Either way, you are breaking the law. In a tweet from the official Texas Attorney General account, the letter is included with a statement, the Texas legislature has made it clear that when it comes to sex education, parents, not school districts, are in charge. Um, the district superintend superintendent, Stephanie El Eliz Elizaldi, responded to the tweet with the usual leftist idiocy. She said, I want all our LGBTQIA plus students to know that we are proud of them and that we will protect them against political attacks. You know, their argument doesn't really make any sense because they say that they're protecting children, but actually they're really harming children and abusing children. Um, at the same time, they sit there and advocate for you know, protect trans kids and protect, you know, trans kids have rights while simultaneously advocating for murdering children in the womb and including after birth up to 28 days old. Which is it? Are you trying to protect the kids or not? And it's neither because protect to them means abuse. That is the definition of protecting the children. Abuse them. The left thinks they can do whatever they want with your children. Luckily, Paxton has given instructions to parents to file grievances with the Texas Education Agency. However, I don't think that this is quite enough. These are government employees, and the government of Texas should be capable of terminating their employment for violations of Texas law. Good on Paxton for acting. 
But I think I am secure in speaking for many parents when I say these people need to be rooted out of our schools. Absolutely. They should be taken out. For sure. Um, speaking of what's happening in Texas, so we know that Governor Abbott has deemed that giving minors cross-sex hormones and doing sex reassignment surgery and things like that on minors is child abuse. So it's against the law. So from breakingchristiannews.com, Disney plans to fight Texas order that labels sex reassignment surgeries on kids as child abuse. It says, during a company-wide staff meeting on Monday, Walt Disney Company executives reportedly announced the company is planning to fight the state of Texas over its order to investigate transgender medical procedures on children as child abuse. This, this is what's so crazy. By the way, this is by Steve Warren. It's just so crazy for them to fight so hard to be able to do this to children. In an exclusive story, the Daily Wire reported Disney's chief human resources officer, Paul Richardson, announced the company is planning to take action against Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott's order to the state's Department of Family and Protective Services to investigate those performing some sex change surgeries or puberty blocking efforts on children. Because of our presence in Texas, Richardson reportedly said, we want you to know that we've signed on to the human rights campaign's letter opposing the Texas bill that criminalizes parents who provide for their transgender children gender affirming care. Ben Shapiro, the editor, um, um, how do you say that? Emeritus, Emer Emeritus of the Daily Wire tweeted a warning to parents on Tuesday. Disney is now injecting itself into politics by endorsing the indoctrination of small children into radical, sexualized worldviews, all because a small, woke base has taken them hostage. It's time to fight back, he wrote. CBN News has reached out to Disney for comment, and they'll, they, will repost, they will post their response when they hear back, so they haven't heard back. <clears throat> um... So it says that, so we know Governor Abbott announced that performing sex reassignment surgeries on minors is a form of child abuse after receiving a report from Jamie Masters, Commissioner of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. Masters, Abbott said in the statement, examined whether genital mutilation of a child for purposes of gender transitioning through reassignment surgery constitutes child abuse. In her letter to Abbott, Masters affirmed it is child abuse. So, Thank God that that happened. Um, so it says that a failure to report suspected abuse within a timely manner could result in a Class A misdemeanor charge, which may include jail time and also sex changes and puberty blockers. Um, and then you have the Disney walkout. Um, but it says here, while some of their fellow employees were planning on walking off the job, some conservative Disney employees have made their views known by posting an anonymous open letter online. The employees write that Disney has, quote, come to be an increasingly uncomfortable place to work for those of us whose political and religious views are not explicitly progressive. Then you leave. You just quit. Period. Instead of asking the company to make political statements on proposed laws, the letter simply asked the company to stay out of politics and remain neutral. But see, they can't because all of their movies and things are political. We know now, after the bill that was passed in Florida, the Parental Rights Act, that the, the one that they say don't say gay bill, which doesn't even say the word gay in the bill, um, to fight back against that, there's a new Disney movie coming out that there was a scene that they deleted, but they since decided to go ahead and put it back in of two women kissing in a Disney movie. So it's always going to be political. You're never going to be able, when your values misalign so much with the company you work for, especially when it's tapping over into your religious views, you should probably just leave. So, when Disney takes sides in political debates, they deprive the world of a shared love we all have in common. TWDC is uniquely situated to provide experiences and entertainment that can bridge our national divide and bring us all together. 
They conclude by saying more than ever, the world needs things that we can unite around. That's the most valuable role the Walt Disney Company could play in the world at this time. It's a role we played for nearly a century, and it would be a shame to throw all of that away in the face of left-wing political pressure. Please don't let Disney become just another thing we divide over. So, um, there's just so many things happening, right? And, um, I'm trying to find... I have this article here um, from the Heritage Foundation. I'm a former teacher. Here's how your children are getting indoctrinated by leftist ideology. Um, they worked with kids from ages 3 to 13 and saw the brainwashing that exists at all levels of education. The left uses a combination of propaganda and suppression to push kids into the ensnaring grip of socialism and anti-patriotism. First is the propaganda. Teachers will assign work instilling the idea that the pillars of Western civilization were evil and their memories deserve to be thrown in the trash. Here's an example. I was helping one of my elementary school students with a homework assignment about listing famous Britons throughout history. She had already some of the more obvious ones, Shakespeare, Princess Diana, Queen Elizabeth. Well, how about Winston Churchill, I recommended. Oh, no, not him, she replied. He was a racist and didn't think women should have rights. He wasn't a good guy. Another way the left propagandizes is through the normalization of its views and positions as non-political. The Black Lives Matter organization is a prime example of this. Many of my colleagues wore Black Lives Matter pins and apparel to school in blatant violation of school rules forbidding political statements on clothing. Um, when I asked for a justification of the behavior, I was told it wasn't political to support the group. It was a matter of human rights. The children would see these pins and clothes and connect radical leftist groups with basic human dignity. How dare you question Black Lives Matter? I was taught this is a matter of human rights. Um, the lessons that he was allowed to teach were censored. Um... It wasn't just a matter of actively teaching that America and the West were evil. Their suppression of wrong think is equally as important to the brainwashing process. He was preparing a lesson on Thanksgiving involving pilgrims and American Indians with an activity centered on making paper teepees for arts and crafts. Cue the progressive panic. Um, other teachers at the school were incensed that a non-Indian was appropriating Native American culture for an activity. Of course, these teachers weren't Indians either. They just wanted to virtue signal. Okay. Um, the suppression extends to American religious values as well. I would try to engage my students with folk stories from around the globe to teach them world history and other cultures. Story time went on without a hitch until I decided to tell stories from the Bible. Other teachers began to complain I was preaching Christian values to the children and attempting to convert them. Keep in mind, this wasn't a problem when I was sharing stories from other ancient cultures throughout history. Stories about ancient India and China were fine and encouraged as sharing unheard voices. After sharing the story of the Tower of Babel, I was told to switch back to non-Christian stories or face consequences. The young adults who today gleefully tear down statues of the founding fathers were incubated in our very own schools, groomed to burst from the education system and burn America down. The left argues that great men and women who built this nation are problematic and must be destroyed. Conservatives must demand an end to the indoctrination of our youth or face a new American public taught since childhood that the country shouldn't exist. It, um, I also have another article here that schools are secretly trying to gen gender transition your kids. This is from the Daily Signal by Emily Cow. Um... It says here, Abigail Martinez called the pain of losing her daughter a pain with no name. Even when you, when you breathe, it hurts, she said during an event on radical gender ideology in schools. Her daughter, Yaley, began struggling with depression in the 7th and 8th grades after classmates criticized her appearance. Abigail described her daughter as a girly girl who liked to dress up as a princess. So when Yaley said one day she felt like a boy, Abigail was surprised. Abigail contacted the school about the bullying, and when they attributed Yali's mental health issues to gender dysphoria, Abigail allowed Yali to adopt a boyish hairstyle and clothes. Well, that's your first problem. You don't do that. 
But when Abigail wanted therapy for Yelly's underlying mental health issues, the school accused her of denying that Yelly had started identifying as Mel in early childhood. What ensued was a wrestling match between Abigail and the government. After California began paying for gender transitions for minors who are not in their parents' custody, Yelly ran away hoping to gain access. School officials told social services that Abigail's daughter would be, quote, better off out of the house. Yali was put into foster care, and despite Abigail's persistent attempts to get mental health treatment for her daughter, the system stonewalled her. While in foster care and on cross-sex hormones, Yali's mental health further declined. In 2019, she committed suicide at only 19 years old. At the event on radical gender ideology at the Heritage Foundation, Abigail told the audience, quote, I want everyone to know the truth about what happened to our family because it didn't have to happen, end quote. More mothers and fathers across the country are waking up to the shock that schools and government officials are promoting transgender ideology in the classroom and then, quote, socially transitioning confused children, sometimes even behind a wall of secrecy. Gender support plans put out by school administrators require school employees to use names and pronouns that align with the student's gender identity instead of their biological sex. One of the world's leading experts on gender dysphoria in children, Dr. Kenneth Zucker, warns that this is a, quote, a psychosocial treatment that will increase the odds of long-term persistence of cases of gender dysphoria. For the vast majority of children, 80 to 90 percent, gender dysphoria is short-term and they will eventually desist from identifying as the opposite sex if allowed to go through puberty. I wouldn't say that it's gender dysphoria for that 80 to 90 percent. It's just their kids. They're small and they don't necessarily know what is a boy and what is a girl. They haven't quite reached that capacity to understand the differences. I don't think they're confused. Um, gender transition is a perilous path. Dr. Stephen Levine described childhood transitions as, quote, experimental with highly unpredictable effects on mental and physical health. Um, su suicidal, is that how you say that? Suicidality and life expectancy. Parents in Wisconsin, Florida, and California filed lawsuits after learning that schools kept them in the dark or even defied their wishes on how to treat their children's gender dysphoria. Why would a school adopt a policy that so blatantly undermines the role of parents? LGBT activist groups like Gender Spectrum and Equality Federation have aggressively pushed legislatures in states like Virginia to adopt them, and school districts have become emboldened to deceive parents. Alliance Defending Freedom recently sent a letter to school administrators in Harrisonburg, Virginia, after they informed staff, quote, If the parent guardian is not aware, you should utilize the student's preferred name at school, but not in any communication with the parent or guardian. The Obama administration promoted gender support plans to schools under the threat of punishment. In May 2016, the Department of Education issued a Dear Colleague letter on the 1972 Title IX Education Amendments that directed schools to use pronouns and names that align with the student's gender identity. Footnote 3 of the letter linked to the department's examples of policies and emerging practices for supporting transgender students. The examples included faculty and staff asking older transgender identifying students um, what amount of information they wanted to disclose to parents. There is no definition of older in the guidance, and some transgender advocacy groups say that a three-year-old can know they are trapped in the wrong body. The policy has resulted in parents across... If a three-year-old can know that they're quote-unquote trapped in the wrong body, shouldn't they be able to do a lot more? Buy cigarettes, buy alcohol, go get a job? If they're so developed that they can de decide that, they can just go take care of themselves, right? The policy has resulted in parents across the country being left without a clue as to what is happening with their children on a day-to-day -day basis. A District of Columbia Public Schools policy stated, quote, Parental participation is not required, and the Chicago Public School guidelines directed staff not to disclose the student's transgender name or pronouns to parents without student permission, and quote, unless authorized to do so by the law department. In 2013, the Obama Department of Education investigated California's Arcadia School District after an LGBT group filed a Title IX claim of sex discrimination 
on behalf of a girl who identified as a boy who was required to use cabins and locker rooms with other females. The, the district reached an agreement with the government that required it to adopt transgender policies. Yali Martinez attended a school in Arcadia and was socially transitioned under this new system. <clears throat> the Obama administration also conducted a Title IX investigation into a school in Ohio and concluded that it had harassed a student by using her birth name and pronouns that aligned with her biological sex. That case was later closed. That case was later closed. Get it on again. By the Department of Education under Betsy Do um, Davos' leadership in 2017. I apologize. I'm getting so tired. I'm almost done. But the Biden ad admin is expected to issue a new Title IX rule soon that will reinstate an, an interpretation of sex to include gender identity in accordance with an executive order from President Joe Biden. The Department of Education has already issued a fact sheet on supporting transgender youth in school that encourages socially transitioning students and maintaining their privacy and confidentiality. It does not require schools to notify parents. Since schools across the country may face loss of funding if they don't comply with the reinterpretation of sex under Title IX, parents can expect even more schools to adopt gender support plans. The foreseeable results is that schools will socially transition more students without their parents' knowledge, much less their consent. The U.S. Constitution and many state constitutions protect parental rights, including the right of parents to direct their child's care and upbringing, and that includes treatment of their child's mental health. Parents and teachers are going to court to protect children from radical ideology that can destroy their minds and bodies. Lawmakers can and should also put parents back in the driver's seat. They can require schools to notify parents if their child is struggling with their gender identity and prohibit schools from engaging in unauthorized treatment of a student's mental health. Doing so would put schools on notice that they cannot deceive parents about significant issues like a student's confusion over gender identity. Yelly Martinez was born in the right body, but like many children, she was confused by a culture and a school system that told her she was born in the wrong one. Her mother knew better. The government should have respected her wishes, not ignored and overridden them. Abigail has allowed her personal tragedy, tragedy to become an example of great courage. Many other families learn from her so that they never have to experience the same pain with no name. This is what's sad. That this kind of stuff is happening. And parents aren't being told about it. And then one day their kid commits suicide. And then they start looking into like why would they do that. And they're going to find this kind of stuff is happening in the school. Without their permission and without their, their acknowledgement of it happening. That girl did not have to get to the point of suicide. It is all these crazy, radical leftist institutions that want to sexualize and destroy our children. And more parents just need to speak up. This is the future generation. We need to be teaching them better. We need to be protecting them and giving them better than what we had. But we're not... They're not getting better than what I had as a kid. It's significantly worse for the kids today than it was for me when I was 15. And when I was 15, it was significantly worse for me as a culture and society than it was when my dad was 15. So it's progressively the culture has declined and disintegrated. So... If we don't do something, it's just going to continue to get worse. And it's going to be really bad for our kids. And I think a lot of kids, as they become young adults, are may turn to suicide. And we're going to see a huge jump in that. I'm telling you, I truly believe we're going to see a spike in suicides of people in their early to mid-20s. I really do. And it's going to be really sad for those families that lose their loved ones. Because it was preventable and it didn't have to happen. I'm going to leave that here for today. I hope you learned something new. I hope you had a good time. Um, I, I feel like this is really important stuff to talk about. There's nothing more important um, on the culture issue than protecting our children. And I will do whatever I can to make sure that children are kept safe. And that parents don't have to go through 
the pain of losing their child to suicide because of what these government radical institutions did to them without them even knowing. But if you're involved with your kids, if your kids have to go to public school, if you can't homeschool, I recommend it. But if you can't and your kids have to go to public school, you have to stay on top of what's going on there. You have to talk to your kids every day about what's taking place in the schools. Because if you don't, then you don't know what's happening. And then it's going to hit you one day. And you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know this was happening. You have to monitor it. You have to ask questions. You have to go to school board meetings to prevent it from ever getting to that point. Anyway, don't forget, please go to Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts. Subscribe to the podcast. You can leave me a review. And go to YouTube and watch my videos there. I'm going to try putting this one up, but I hope it doesn't get taken down. I'm, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to make the risk to get it up on YouTube. I think it's worth it. And after you go and watch my videos, like and share them. You can leave me a comment. But best of all, you can subscribe to my channel. That would be really great. And hit the notification bell so you know when I upload new videos. And um, I'll link all of these articles in the description. So if you want to go look at them, you can. And also, you know, my link tree is in the description as well. So you can get to all of my social media accounts and follow me there. Anyway, I hope you have a good rest of your day. I am done. And now I'm going to go to bed before I have to get up and go to work. Have a good day. God bless.